And also, I would just like to encourage all of you to continue to pray for your family, continue to pray for your friends, continue to pray for the literature, the books, the brochures we're passing out, because did you know that God is the God of the city? I come from Tennessee. Tennessee, a lot of people say San Francisco is terrible. It's about ready to fall into the ocean. I've lived here now for several years, and I can say God loves the people in Tennessee. And God loves the people in San Francisco. Amen. Amen. And so there still is a lot of people here. Going back, if any of you need any help with our uh, translation service today. And uh, now we have a little Bible study for you. I hope that you're blessed by this Bible study. Let's bow our heads and we'll start with prayer. Dear God in heaven, as we open your word, we pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. We invite your Holy Spirit to come and impress our hearts on the things we need to change. God, we don't want to come to your word today and read and ignore it and go on our way. We want to come and be changed people. We've been reminded today that if it were not for grace, where would we be? Dear God, please give us your grace right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you to go back with me 37 years. 37 years ago, I started nursing. For those of you that are nurses, you know that the most difficult part of nursing is the first quarter or the first semester. There's a lot of theory. There's a lot of just kind of basics. But also, it's learning how to just kind of put everything together and study. Well, when I started nursing 35 years ago, they had to study a lot of things. And one of the things we studied was something known as Erickson's, Erickson's stages of life and conflicts. Any of you know what this is about? A few people, yes, we've heard of it. For those of you that haven't heard of it, you might think this is my most boring, dry psychology that I could go over with you, but I just want to touch on this briefly, and then we're going to get into a Bible study, but this is going to play a lot into the Bible study we're going to talk about, so please pay attention. Erickson was a psychologist that lived uh, back in the 1950s, and as he looked at people, and he looked at their stages of life, what he identified was eight different stages, but he said in each of these eight different stages, there's an area that needs to be taken care of, and if not, it can affect a person throughout the rest of their life. He talks about the stage of infancy, birth to 18 months, and he said it's during this stage there's a conflict, and the main conflict that children go through is what? You want to guess? You can look on the screen behind me. Trust versus mistrust. Children in this age, they're learning how to trust. They're learning, can I trust this person? And during this phase of life, this conflict, so to speak, if they're not able to master trust, they can go through the rest of their life with distrust. Early childhood, they're learning autonomy, being able to do things on their own. You know, two to three years old. What's their favorite word, two to three years old? No, me, me. But if you break them down, if you hurt them, then they can grow up with a lot of shame and doubt. Then we go to the next stage of life, preschool, and there they are looking at initiative versus guilt. And some of you are kind of like, okay, this is way too dry. Listen closely, okay? Because in all of our lives, we have stages and there's conflicts. And if you resolve this conflict in a healthy way, you will move on in your life and you will be able to tackle difficulties and problems in a healthy way. But if you don't, yes, you're still going to move on in your life, but you can have problems throughout the rest of your life, perhaps with mistrust or with shame or even with guilt. We move on now to the school age. 6 to 11 years old, and you, the conflict there is, are they going to go down the pathway of industry or inferiority? Then you move on to the next stage, which is adolescence, identity versus role confusion. I thought this was very significant because in the past few years, particularly with COVID, we've seen a lot of people in this age group that have a role confusion. They haven't seen their identity as a male or as a female, and they have these role confusions that are coming up, and we've seen this, especially in this age group here, and yet this was a psychology principle that was brought out in the 1950s, and it's during this age group, 12 to 18 years old, that if people are not affirmed in their identity, if people are given misinformation, if people are confused about this, 
They can grow up to have a role confusion that will affect them the rest of their life based on this conflict that was not resolved here in the ages of 12 to 18 years old. Then we go on to the next uh, stage, young adulthood, 19 to 40 years old. Anybody here 38 years old and you're like, hey, I'm still considered a young adult. (laughs) I saw this, I'm like, wow, that's really nice. Still a young adult, even though I'm way past that. But during this period of time, the the crisis, the conflict is between intimacy or isolation. They're looking for a life spouse. They're looking for a partner. They're looking for a, a husband or a wife. And, and if they have some bad experiences or if it doesn't work out, then they're not going to be going down the intimacy pathway. They could go down the isolation pathway. And then you get into my old age group, middle adulthood, and 40 to 65 years old, the crisis or the conflict here is generativity, you know, being a, a generating, generating part of society or just stagnation. I remember a few years ago when I was about 50 years old, many years ago when I was about 50 years old, I just kind of felt like my life was blah, you know, it's just like, okay, I've been working as a flight nurse now for 20 years, I've been married now for like, you know, 10, 15 years, it's like just doing the same thing over again, and I remember thinking back to Erickson's stages of life, and it's like, okay, you need to start being productive and not become stagnant. This is why you'll find a lot of people in this uh, age group here, they have a midlife crisis, you know, they, they start doing things because they're struggling against that whole stagnation thing that's happening. And then we come to the last stage, which is maturity. I think that's a pretty nice way of saying it. <laughs> maturity, 65 to death, and the conflict there is either egg, ego integrity or despair. One of the things you will find with people that are 65 and older is they look back in their life and they can either focus on their failures, focus on the things that they didn't do right and it just brings despair, or they can focus on their successes, focus on the things they did good, and it helps them to remember that, hey, you know what? You made a difference in the world while you were here. I remember frequently I I speak with my mother and sometimes she talks about the past because my mother is almost 90 years old and Sometimes she'll speak about the past, say, you know, I, I just feel bad about the way I raised you kids, and I feel bad about some of the things I do, but I'm like, mother, you have six wonderful kids that love Jesus. What more can you ask for? And so if you know somebody that's maybe in this mature category, continue to remind them what they've done to be a blessing to other people, because it's easy at this point of time to kind of have this conflict where they just kind of slip into despair. Now, my goal today is not to give you a psychology class, but I would encourage any of you, if if you've seen something here and you're like, you know what, I want to learn a little bit more about this, just go to YouTube or do a Google search for Eric's and Stages of Life, and there's many articles, there's many people that lecture about it, and it'll maybe bring one of those aha moments to you, and you can focus on where you are, and you can say, okay, what is an area that I need to maybe do differently so that I can handle this conflict in this stage of life in an effective, healthy way so that I can move on to the next conflict and be able to handle it with the tools that I need. But today what I would like to do is I would like to talk to you about Christ's stages of spiritual growth and conflicts. Because as I was thinking about Erickson's model, I thought, you know what? Christ said something very similar to this. And Erickson had eight stages of life. Christ talks about four stages in your spiritual life. How many stages? Four. And in each of those stages, Christ identifies a conflict. Christ identifies a crisis. Christ identifies an area in that stage in your spiritual life where you can either do it in a, you can resolve your conflict in a healthy way or you can do it in a detrimental way that is detrimental to your spiritual life. Now, The Bible tells us about a parable about a sower. Jesus is his most popular parable, and Jesus says the sower went out to sow, and he was sowing seeds, and some of it landed on the pathway, some of it landed on a rocky area, some of it landed on a thorny area, and some of it landed in good area, and it produced fruit. Well, this parable has been studied by many theologians, and you can look at it different ways, but today we're going to look at it 
principally from this standpoint right here of stages of spiritual growth and what? Conflicts. So I hope this makes sense. Stay with me at the end of this Bible study. I know that you're going to be blessed. So um, this parable actually is found in four place, three places, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now what I like to do whenever I study a, a teaching of Jesus or a parable or a story is I like to compare it against the different uh, accounts. And the way I do it is I don't like to just turn pages in my Bible. I go and I copy and paste, and I'll paste the story in three or four columns or two columns, if it's only found in two places, on a, on a Word document. And then I sit and I kind of compare it. So that's what we're going to do today, okay? I'm just going to lead you on a little Bible study. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at this parable of the sower, and we're going to look at it and compare it through the different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, this is too small for you all to read, probably, so instead of making it bigger, what I'm going to do is I am just going to uh, use two, uh, two, sl- uh, two uh, parallel tables, and you'll be able to see it from there, okay? So uh, the, the story goes like this, okay? Mark gives us the account, and it says, listen. I like Mark's account. You know, it's like, listen. <laughs> I mean, imagine if Jesus comes in here today, and he's like, hi, my name is Jesus. Now, listen up. You know, it's kind of like, listen, I got something important to tell you. That's what Mark tells us. So you can just imagine Jesus as he's there by the Sea of Galilee. And he says, listen. This is what Jesus is telling us today. What is Jesus telling us today? Listen. Listen. A farmer went out to sow his seed. Luke says a farmer went out to sow his seed. Matthew says a farmer went out to sow his seed. Never forget that the farmer that is sowing seed is sowing his seed. He's not sowing someone else's seed. It's his seed. If the farmer is Jesus in this story, then the farmer is sowing his seed. But if you're going to be the farmer, you have to make sure that this is your ideas. This is your doctrine. No, not a doctrine apart from the Bible, but you have to adopt this as yourself. The Bible tells us about a time when Paul is preaching and he's preaching about Christ and some sons of Siva who were sons of the high priest, they were like, wow, Paul is pretty powerful. So they went to a demon-possessed man and they say, okay, in the name of Jesus and in the name of Paul, come out of him. And the demon says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the demons jumped on the man. Uh, the the demon-possessed man jumped on these sons of Seva and beat them up, tore their clothes off, and they ran out. You and I cannot share something that is not our own. You and I cannot share a truth that we don't believe ourselves. So the first thing we see here is that the farmer went out to sow what? His seed. Now, I told you we were going to look at a little seed here. Does anybody know what this is called? An acorn, good. And what does an acorn grow? Okay, let me help you out. Multiple choice, okay? An acorn produces tomatoes, squash, redwood tree, or oak tree. Okay, who says redwood tree? Who says oak tree? Okay, it's an oak tree. (laughs) Oh, you're like, oh, man, okay, I will... You're from Australia, okay? I should have said a eucalyptus tree. No, I'm just joking. So this produces an acorn, uh, acorn tree. An acorn produces an oak tree. Where we live, we have oak trees that are like this big, huge. Everything to produce an oak tree is right here. Isn't that amazing? Here's another seed. I, I brought this for you from our garden today. Anybody want to guess what this seed is? Pretty cool, huh? That's a huge old sunflower. How many seeds do you see right there? 217. 217. And he's from Australia, right? I mean, you can see all the little uh, seeds there. This one here is a special gift from Patricia to um, uh, Jean Caramouse. So Jean, you get this, and housekeeping gets the rest of it on the floor. But when we're talking about seeds, seeds have everything inside they need to be able to grow, to be able to, to produce a crop, to be able to produce something. But I said, everything is here. But this needs something else. What does this need? 
It needs soil. It needs water. Sunlight. You see, if I take this seed that has everything it needs for an oak tree and I put it right here and leave it there for 10 years, what are we going to have? A dried up seed. <laughs> because it needs an environment. And this is what we find in this parable is it's focusing on the environment. It's not focusing so much on the seed. The seed is the same everywhere. But the environment changes. Mark chapter 4 Verse 4 says, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And what happens? The birds come and they ate it up. So the first one, the first scenario we have is the seeds fell along the path. Where did it fall? Along the path. Where does it fall? Along the path. Where does it fall? Along the path. Where does it fall? Along the path, okay? Now, Luke adds something, and this is what I do when I do my Bible study, is I circle, oh, well, this is what Luke adds. Look what Luke adds over here. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path. It was what? Trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. So Luke adds from his narrative that, you know what? Not only did the birds come and snatch it, but the seed was injured. The seed was disrespected. The seed was trampled on. Okay, let's move on to, let's just talk about this for just a moment. If I'm a farmer and you see me spreading seeds on pathways and roads, you'd probably think that I was a little bit clueless as a farmer. But the word here in the Greek is not a highway. The word here in the Greek is a footpath. And here's a picture I found on the internet. And here you have a road. And then what do you call this right over here? A little path. You see, what happened was the people were like, maybe there was a muddy spot there or something. They were like, you know what? We're just going to walk around. We're going to walk in this farmer's field. And they're walking in the farmer's field. And before long, there's a path there. In order for that farmer to reclaim that land, he is going to have to dig up that path, that hard packed, and make it fertile soil again. Does this make sense? So the first area we see is that the, the seed fell on the what? Path. Okay, let's go to the fourth one, second one. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up. So did the first scenario, did it spring up? No, no. It hits the ground and what happens? Two things happen to it. It gets trampled on and... The birds take it away. But now, some seed falls on an area that has not a lot of soil, but has a lot of rocks. We call this the rocky area, okay? So the first area was the what? The path. The second area is the rocky area. What's wrong with the rocky area? Look what it says up here under Mark. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Now, sun is good. You just said over here, in order for this tree to grow, we need sun and soil and water. Sun is good. But if there is not a lot of soil, the sun can hurt the plant. Luke adds, some fell on rock and when it came up, the plants withered because what? They had no moisture. Boy, those rocks are something else, aren't they? Okay, so the first one was, it fell on the path. Second one, it fell on the rocky. Others fell among thorns. So the third one was what? Thorns. So the first one is path. Second one is rocky. Third one is Thorns. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Here you will find Mark adds a little bit of information that Luke doesn't have. It, it chokes it out so they're not able to grow grain. When you look at the different scenarios here, it seems to be different phases. The first one is a seed that is snatched away. The second one is a small plant, just a small little plant that withers and dies. But now you have a plant that's big and strong and healthy. But the problem here is what? 
It's not bearing fruit. It's a big plant, but it's competing with thorns, and so it doesn't bear grain. Now we move on to the next scenario. Still other seed fell on good soil. Okay, let's do a quick review. Scenario number one was the path, the stones, the rocks, the thorns. Now we have good soil. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop. You see, if you're a farmer, you're not just, your goal is not just, I planted seeds. Your goal is not like, hey, I don't come home to my wife and say, guess what? Guess what? You won't believe what I did today? I planted seeds. Your goal is not just for the seeds to sprout. Your goal is not for the seeds to even grow up and become big plants. What is the farmer's goal for his garden? Fruit, a crop. And here, finally, we get to scenario number four. And scenario number four, verse eight, still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. You see, I don't want to make a mess again, but this is the result of one sunflower seed. And you look here and you will see there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sunflower seeds. This sunflower, I like the biggest sunflower I can get. This thing was like 15 feet tall. I had to pull the thing over and whack on it with a machete. What do you call it, a bolo knife? I had to whack the thing off. This thing is heavy, but this came from one seed. If you look here at the uh, oak tree, I'm sorry, the uh, acorn, with the acorn, one acorn can make a oak tree and that oak tree can produce thousands of acorns this is what god wants to do in your life he doesn't want you to say okay it's just me no he says i want you to go and be a blessing not to one person or two people but to 30 40 50 100 people he wants to multiply in your life and this is the principles we see here in the story of the sower. Now Jesus talked to his disciples and Jesus explained what this parable means. We've talked about the different stages, a seed, a sprout, a full plant, and a fruit producing plant. We've seen that you have the hard soil, the, um, what was the second one? Uh, Good, good, good. The rocky soil, the, the good, the thorn soil, and the good soil. We see that. But what does it mean? Well, now Jesus explains it, and you will find that we're going to apply this to the same model that Erickson used back in the 1950s. Christ's stages of spiritual growth. Number one was a seed. Number two was a young sprout. Number three was a full-grown plant. And number four was a mature plant with fruit. In each of these stages, there's a conflict. In each of these stages, this conflict, if it's not resolved, could actually kill the plant. Or it'll make the plant so it's not fruitful. In your life, in my life, in each of these stages, if we don't resolve the conflict we will not be fruitful. You're like, what's the conflict? You want to know what the conflict is? Oh, I was hoping there'd be more enthusiasm, but here we go. Mark 4, thir- Mark 4, 14 says, the farmer sows what? The word. Luke says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is what? The word of God. So we don't have to sit there and say, oh, nice story about a farmer sowing seed. No, Jesus now explains it, and Jesus explains it so clear. He's like, hey, We're not talking about sowing seeds in a field. We're talking about the word of God in your life, the word of God in my life. So what we see here is that the seed is the word of God. This is amazing when you think about it. This has everything it needs to be a beautiful big oak tree if it has the right conditions. 
This has everything it needs to transform your life if it has the right conditions. This is the Word of God. Let me tell you how powerful the Word of God is. Many years ago, God said, Let there be light. There was light. Many years ago, God said, Let there be trees. And there was trees, 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 trees. I mean, God's word has creative power. My word has information power. My word might even have authority to get you to do something. There's a fire, run! (laughs) That's all my word can do. God's word can create. I mean, imagine if God was right here, right now, and God were to say tree. What would happen right here? A tree. I mean, God's word is creative. God's word is powerful. God's word says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. When you confess your sin, what happens? You're forgiven. You know why? Because God said so. When you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, you have become a child of the king. You might say, well, I don't feel like a child of the king. doesn't matter. Because God has now made you a child of the king because his word is creative. I mean, we, we, we sometimes think that this is like the yellow pages or like a history book. No, 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 this is God's word. It can change us on the inside. So when we look here, the farmer sows the word, okay? So where does the farmer sow the word? Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom of God and does not what? Understand it. I want you to focus there where it says does not understand it. Now, these are not different accounts of what Jesus said, and maybe Jesus didn't say it. No, no, no. Jesus is talking, and as he talks, he's giving a discourse, and Matthew remembers some of it. Luke remembers some of it. Mark is listening to Peter, and he remembers some of it, and so you put it all together, and what we find is that in this discussion Jesus is having, he says, listen, not only do you need to hear the word, but you need to, what does Matthew say? You need to understand it. Because if you don't understand it, it's like a bird that comes and snatches it away. But no, we're not talking about birds snatching seed here. We're talking about the devil comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. Why is Satan so interested in snatching away the truth? Well, look what Luke says. So that they may not, what? Believe and be saved. God's word is so powerful that when you take it into your life, it is salvation. God's word is so powerful that when you believe in Jesus Christ as your savior, you can be saved. And Satan says, don't let that person do that. Don't let him do that. And he snatches it away. This comes from a great book called Christ's Object Lessons. Talking about this parable, we're talking about right here. Look what it says. The seed sown by the wayside, the first first circumstance, the wayside, represents the word of God as it falls upon the heart of an inattentive hearer. Like the hard beaten path trodden down by the feet of men and beasts is the heart that becomes a highway for the world's traffic, its pleasures, and what's that word up there? Sins. Absorbed in selfish aims and sinful indulgences, the soul is hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The spiritual faculties are paralyzed. Men hear the word, but they don't understand it. They do not discern that it applies to themselves. They do not realize their need or their danger. They do not perceive the love of Christ, and they pass by the message of his grace as something that does not concern them. Christ's stages of spiritual growth and conflicts. If we're looking at the first phase, the first phase when that seed hits that hard beaten path, that hard beaten path is symbolized by the hardness and trampling, which is what? Sin. Now, the farmer has hope for that area. Otherwise, he wouldn't waste his seed on it. God has hope for everybody's life. 
He doesn't waste his precious grace on anybody. But it's up to us to make a change. And the change that needs to be happening here is we need to, if you're a farmer, you need to kind of take a, a, a shovel and a rake and you need to break up the soil. That's literally, but what is that spiritually? We need to get what out of our lives? Sin. If you find that you don't understand the Bible, that you have no interest in the Bible, that you're here because someone invited you here and you have no interest, I'll just talk to you really frankly. It's because sin is competing with the Bible. Sin will always win because sin includes deception and lies, whereas the Bible only goes with truth. So take a look at your life and say, you know what? Just for a month, I'm going to stop the sinning and focus on my relationship with Jesus. And you'll find when Jesus comes into your life, he replaces the sin and all the badness about sin is gone. Some people are like, but sin is so good. Sin is exciting. Yeah, but sin also brings guilt. Sin brings pain. Sin brings scarring. And all that Christ can take away. Let's look at the next phase. Anybody remember what, the, what circumstance number two is? That's right, rocky. Here we go. Others like seeds sown on rocky places. Actually, let's look at Luke's on the right-hand side. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word of God with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for how long? A while. But in the time of testing, they fall away. What does the time of testing look like? Well, let's go over to Mark. When trouble or what? Persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. You could say that the stones represent trouble and persecution. What do the stones represent? Trouble and persecution. So the hard ground represents, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the hard ground represents sins. We need to break up that hard ground. No more hard ground. But can we get rid of trouble and persecution in our lives? No, it's going to be there. But what you can do is you can take all those rocks and you can put them over here. Because I want my garden to grow strong here. Don't let the rocks, don't let the problems and persecution destroy your faith. We have people in our church right now, and they just lost their nine-year-old daughter. She just passed away. They're grieving, but their faith in God is growing stronger. Amen. The same thing can then happen to all of us. We can go through difficult times, and it can either break our faith, or it can strengthen our faith. A few months ago, I was in a bad accident, broke 18 bones. I'm laying in the hospital for week after week. And there's little thoughts in my mind, you know, why did God allow this to happen to me, the pastor? I'd push those thoughts away and I'd be like, you know what? This happened because of my stupidity. But God is the one that saved my life and he's going to get me through this time. Don't let the rocks, don't let the trouble and persecution push out your faith. Put those rocks back on the side. Yes, we have to deal with them. But my faith can grow stronger because of the difficulties. Let's go back to our fourth, sorry, our third stage. Anybody remember the first one? The path. What does the path represent? Sin. Good. Second one was? Rocks. What does rocks represent? Persecution and troubles. Any of you have persecution and troubles? Let your faith grow stronger despite that. All right, let's go to the fourth, third one now, okay? Um, let's look over here on the right-hand side. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by, let's say it all together, life's worries, riches, and pleasures. And they do not mature. Let's look over at Mark says. These things come up and choke the word, making it unfruitful think about this for just a moment 
Satan wants to use troubles and persecutions to blow up your faith. And if those don't work, he is not at all hesitant about using riches and pleasures. Have you ever heard of a pastor, a powerful pastor, that is caught in a scandal? I mean, this happened just a few years ago. There was a big, huge church over in Australia, actually. Tens of thousands of members. The pastor has been caught in a scandal. The pastor is demoted. His church falls apart. What did Satan use? Riches and pleasures. And it's not just the pastor that Satan is after. He's after all of us here. Satan's goal is that we will become unfruitful. And if he can use troubles and difficulties, he'll throw it at you. And if that doesn't work, he's more than happy to use pleasures and riches to make you unfruitful. Isn't it neat the way God shows us the different crises in each of these stages and shows us how to deal with it? There's this really cool book called Steps to Christ. Before we go to Steps to Christ, uh, let's do a review. The conflict for the first stage is what? Sin. The conflict for the second stage is what? Trouble and persecution. The conflict for the third stage is riches, worries, and pleasures. Now we go to that little book called Steps to Christ. Look what it says. When the mind dwells upon self. When the mind dwells on what? Self. Self. When the mind dwells on what? Self. It is turned away from Christ, the source of strength and life. Hence, it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ. Satan wants to come in between you and Christ. Satan wants to come in between you and Jesus Christ, and he is going to use four things to do it. Look what the writer here says. The pleasures of the world, life's cares and perplexities and sorrows, the faults of others, or even your own faults and imperfections. To any or all of these, he will seek to divert your mind. Do not be misled by Satan's devices. Let's break this down even further, okay? Satan wants to come in between you and Christ, and he's going to use four things to do it. Number one, what? The pleasures of this world. Number two, life's cares and perplexities and sorrows. Doesn't this sound like the, uh, the sower parable? What do the rocks represent? Sorrow, hardship, persecution. What do the thorns represent? Pleasures and riches. Here the writer of Steps to Christ says, Satan wants to use the pleasures of this world to come in between you and Christ. He also wants life's cares, perplexities, and sorrows. The faults of other people or even your own faults. Notice back here that the way Satan can get a mature Christian to not bear fruit is with riches and worries and pleasures. So, when you look at these conflicts, if I recognize, you know what? The Bible is boring. I just don't understand it. I mean, my heart is so hard. I need to get sin out of my life. If I look and I'm just a young sprout and I feel myself just kind of dying and I just don't get any water and it just seems like all the hardships and trials, it's like I need to push those things back and say, you know what? Even if... I die, I'm still going to hold on to Jesus Christ through this. I am not going to give up on my Bible study time. I'm not going to give up on my church time. I'm not going to give up on my prayer time. I'm not going to stop singing good Christian songs because during these hardships, I need to hold on to Jesus tighter than I've ever held on to him before. But let's say that you're a pretty good-looking Christian. You're strong, healthy, and you just have so much money and so many toys, and so many things to go to. I mean, you got to go to this uh, friend is getting married, and they've invited you to go to Hawaii over here, and you have this vacation to go to, and you have this to go to, and I just don't have any time to help out in church, and I am so busy. I don't have any time for devotions, and I don't have any time to have spiritual time, and I don't have any time to work for God. Hey, guys, 
Reign in those riches and pleasures because those thorns are going to crowd out your fruitfulness. What does Jesus say? The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are what? Choked by life's worries. Choked by the riches and choked by pleasures. Some of you here are like, oh, I just wish I could be choked with some riches. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. Because some of those people that have a lot of money, they're not here today. Because they are being choked by all their riches. Not my words. It's Jesus' words. Let's move on. We're running out of time. Matthew chapter 13 but the one who received the good soil, received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and what? Understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or even thirty times what was sown. Mark says, others like the seed sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times what was sown. So many times we hear this parable like, okay. The pathway, bad. The stony ground, bad soil. The thorny ground, bad soil. But now we come to the good soil. But you know what? All of those soils were good. The pathway was good soil. It just was stomped down. It needed somebody to like till it up. The stony ground, what's underneath the stones? Good soil. Move those stones to the side. What about the thorny ground? Is that good soil? Oh yeah, it is so good soil, it can grow the biggest weeds around. The biggest thorns. What you will find is that if you want to get to this point right here, but the one who received the seed that fell on good soil, the good soil means a person has been working on the on the uh, caked soil. They have moved the rocks to the side. They've pulled up the weeds. And they keep doing it. Did you know thorns like to come back? And they like to come back? And they like to come back? Every time you have a heavy rain, the stones come rolling back in. Every time you have visitors over to pick some of your squash, they trample on your soil. If you want to produce a crop, you have to continually be looking at the three conflicts. Guard your life against sin. Guard your life that the persecution doesn't stamp out your faith. Guard your life that the pleasures and the riches don't choke out your spirituality. I want to show you something here. This is kind of neat. Check this out, okay? We're going to look at all three now as we close. Matthew says, he hears the word and what? <laughs> Understands it. Mark uses a completely different word and says he hears the word and accepts it. So let's take a look here at the Greek, okay? The Greek says, for the word understands means to bring it together, to join in your mind. Oh, I understand that. That's what the word understand means is to bring it together, to be able to join it together in your mind. Now, Mark uses a different word that is in my translation here, translated as accept it, but the word accept means to receive, take it personally. It implies ownership and possession. So this isn't my church's teaching. This isn't my pastor's teaching. This is my belief. That's what the word, hears the word and accepts it. So you just don't take this and say, you know what? My pastor believes that this is God's word. That's not accepting it. If you accept this, you say, I believe that this is God's word. Does this make sense? Let's go over now to Luke, okay? We put Luke up on the, uh, the right-hand side. It says, who hears the word and retain it. That's an interesting word. It's a completely different Greek word, and that word means to hold fast, keep secure, actively keep from going away. This Greek word is used where when you dock your boat, you tie your boat up so it doesn't drift away. If you want your faith to be strong, friends, you have to take God's word and cling to it and hold it and protect it as if it is a boat that wants to leave in a storm. This isn't just a 
This isn't just a a gift from God that we can take for granted. This is something that we embrace, we understand it, we accept it as our own, and we cling to it because it connects us with God himself. Notice what Luke here says, and it says, by persevering, they produce a crop. By persevering, they produce a crop. That word persevering is a Greek word that literally means patience under suffering. Some of you think that, hey, you know what? When I give my life to Jesus, everything's going to be okay. Yeah, you stay with Jesus and everything's going to be okay. But you're still going to have some problems. You're still going to have some suffering. But never forget, he promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. Persevere. Persevere. When you look at Christ's stages of spiritual growth, you will see that the, the conflict with seed is we have to what? Get the sin out of our life. The conflict with the young sprout is what? Trouble and persecution. Don't let the trouble and persecution kill your faith. Push those rocks to the side. Yes, they're still going to be there. But you can take the rocks in your garden and you can make them a barrier around your garden to keep all the little critters out. You can take those difficulties And you can embrace them and say, this is getting me closer to Jesus. Years ago, there was a great man by the name of Paul. Some people know him as St. Paul. Paul had a problem. He called it a thorn in his flesh. And he said, I went to God three times and begged him to take it away from me. Some of you here have health problems. Some of you have mental problems. Some of you have physical problems. Some of you have issues in your life. And you're just like, God, take this away from me. This is what Paul did. He goes to God and he says, take this away from me. And then he gets an answer from God, and the answer from God is, my strength is sufficient for you. For my, my, sorry, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know what Paul said after that? From now on, I am going to glory in my infirmities. I'm going to boast about my problems. Because when I am weak, then he is strong. The third stage of spiritual growth is the person who is a mature Christian. But they don't have fruit in their life because the riches and worries and pleasures have choked it out. Some of us here maybe need to get rid of some of our pleasures. Maybe you need to sell or give away that thing or those things that is choking out your spiritual life. But never forget, there's not three conflicts, there's four conflicts. Because we have to maintain the good soil. I believe that there are Christians who make it to this point here. They are producing fruit, and then they go back, and maybe the riches and the worries and the pleasures choke it out. Friends, when you see that little shoot of a thorn plant growing up, you need to pull that out because it'll grow up and then it chokes out your fruitfulness. Have you learned something today? Isn't it amazing how God's word comes alive? I would just like to encourage you, take this Bible study and take it further. There's a great sermon series my wife and I were listening to on the way to church today by one of my favorite speakers, David Asherick, and he goes into the same parable from a different perspective. And if you would like to listen to that, email me at adventistpastor at gmail.com and I'll send you the link to that. Take the little book, Christ Object Lesson. I can also send you a PDF copy of that as well. And you can study this parable and you can just take God's word and it will become a part of your life. I'd like to invite our worship team to come up as we sing our closing song. But before we do, I'd just like to have a word of prayer over you right now. God in heaven, I just pray that you would please open our hearts and our minds and show us the areas that you want to change in our hearts. Show us the soil that needs to be broken up, the sins that need to be taken out. I pray that you would show us the thorns and the stones that need to be removed so that we can be fruitful. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a quick close. I forgot these slides. Check it out. It's not the seed on trial here. Let's say it all together. 
It's the conditions and stages that Christ focuses on. Sometimes we focus, I don't like the word. It's written, I don't like it. I don't like, no, 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 no. That's not on trial. We can change what's happening in our lives. Next point, if we resolve the three conflicts, what? You can expect fruit. But on the other hand, let's say it all together. If we don't resolve the three conflicts, we cannot produce fruit. And finally, we have to continually soften the soil, remove the rocks, dig up the thorns to protect the plants. What does that mean? We have to continually work to stop sinning. Don't let hardships kill your faith. And don't let the pleasures choke out your faith. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand together as we sing our closing song, 251. How many of you believe he lives? He lives. Let's sing it together. I got a question for you. How do you know he lives? Amen. How do you know he lives? He lives within my heart. Amen. And the way he lives within your heart is you invite him into your heart. Let's invite him into our hearts at this time. We're going to sing, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It's a new song for some of you, but you'll pick it up quick. It's a great chorus. Here we go.
Amen. You may be seated. Just have a couple of quick announcements for you. If you would like to have special prayer, perhaps you are going through a difficult time or you have a prayer of thanksgiving, please join us in the room here beside the resource room, and we would love to pray for you and with you. Also wanted to remind you that we have a good meal downstairs that we'd like to invite you all to. We have a good, nice vegetarian fellowship meal. You just need to bring your appetite downstairs. And then right after the meal, what are we going to do? That's right. We need your help to help put together some bags where we're going to have some health material, some Bible material, and an invitation for the meetings. And then this week we have more than 100 volunteers that are going to be coming to our city and passing 25, 28,000 different uh, little bags and brochures out to people. So we're going to be putting those together this afternoon. We need a lot of volunteers. So when you go down to eat this wonderful meal, eat up a bunch And then this afternoon, we're going to be putting together some of these uh, uh, materials. We're going to tell you about it before uh, downstairs. So don't worry. We're going to give you good instructions. But if you could just stay for one hour after the meal, two hours, we can get this done. Then the last thing, Pastor Roldan's coming up, and I know what he's going to say, and that is we need all of you to take some of these with you. Now, don't just take, you know, a pile of 500 and leave them in your apartment. No, we want you to take as many as you can pass out this week, give it to your friends, give it to your coworkers, and just encourage them. Say, hey, I'd like to invite you to come to these series. All they have to do is just scan the QR code, register, so that way we can get an idea of who's coming. It helps us with our meal preparation and planning. But also, pass these out. You can put these anywhere you want except mailboxes. It's illegal to put these into mailboxes, but you can put these underneath the mailboxes where the parcels go in your apartment. You can place them on the on the bus when you get off. Oh, I left behind something. Now, don't be throwing litter in people's yards or anything, but uh, take these and pass these out and invite people to come to our meetings. Okay, you will get these at the back of the church. Pastor Roldan has them right back here at the back on the white... uh, on the white table, uh, we have them in the resource room, and then we will see you all downstairs. If you're like, I don't want to eat, don't eat then, but stay and help us as we put together the packages this evening, this afternoon, after lunch, okay? Any questions? Ask Pastor Roldan on your way out. God bless you, and have a wonderful Sabbath.